So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is really weird. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll talk a little bit about the um, ICF research initiatives. And uh, I will try to introduce the team to, uh, to more or less talk a little bit about uh, the, the few like ongoing projects and, uh, and hopefully uh, yeah, we can engage in some discussion on this so, uh, in a spirit of the conversations. Um, so, just briefly, uh, I'm Jacques Kominosic from, from ICF, and uh, so I, I, I'm into this distributed system already quite some time before the, the uh, fancy money stuff. And uh, right now, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to help people at ICF uh, uh, on most of the research and engineering front. And uh, so, what we are trying to do essentially is uh, we are, like from the more kind of research point of view, we are building decentralized infrastructure, uh, which is a uh, planetary scale, uh, which should be correct, secure, and reliable, and uh, which should be formally verified, beauty tolerant, and efficient. So, as you see, there are, there are quite uh, like a lot of stuff here. So, it's, people normally tell us that, that it's a very ambitious project, and it's indeed an ambitious project, but, but that's, that's it. And uh, so there are there are a bunch of uh, topics we are trying to address, uh, like both internally and also with the help of people outside. Um, and so, like um, as you see, there are quite like different part of computer science involved here. This is what is kind of uh, interesting and challenging at the same time. So we are looking at both uh, like uh, distributed algorithms, like really fundamental protocols, uh, then how to apply a formal application technique. To, to the both protocol and code level, uh, then we are also looking at, uh, at at least this is something we are hoping to start more serious to looking at uh, mechanism design. So how to apply incentives to the uh, or how to incentivize correct behavior at the protocol level. Uh, then also uh, uh, database research is something we also are, are trying to bootstrap now uh, as it's. Um, it seems to be a bottleneck in the, in the real systems. So essentially there are no industry-grade uh, Merkleis data store right now. And so we are, we are talking with, uh, with some people to try to help us do this sort of from scratch, like in a proper way. Um, there is also, of course, like system research in trying to make our implementations and protocol more efficient. Um, and one thing which is very important, and I will probably spend most of, of this talk talking about is implementation. Because like, uh, these three protocols are hard, but then implementing them correctly is like even harder. And this is something we, we kind of don't know really how to do correctly. And uh, in general, as a community, even more broader distributed system community. Um, and finally, there is security in crypto, which uh, is something we are mostly uh, doing outside ICF, we say. But it's, there is some activity also there, very important one, but we don't yet have internal capability. Uh, so uh, I just want to, to kind of, uh, uh, this kind of first occasion to, for us also to present the ICF uh, research and engineering team. So these are the people in the first row who are uh, driving and helping uh, with the ICF research initiative. Uh, so we have kind of a mix of uh, researchers like Joseph and Igor who are formal verification researchers. Uh, then we have like uh, distributed system engineers like uh, Anka, Tane, uh, Sean, Bucky, and, and we have infrastructure people like Greg. And so, like interestingly, like uh, all our engineers are <laughs> are involved in the in the research initiative right now. So when I was kind of preparing this slide, I realized that that this is kind of quite cool. That uh, all not just researchers but also all engineers, and this is something we are really trying to do. Uh, in, in this team, that we build a balanced team of engineers and researchers who will work together to achieve some nice results. And we, of course, collaborate with many people outside because the, these are hard topics and, of course, we cannot do it together. And so, apart from the, uh, our colleagues from all and bits, uh, like Anton, Ishmael, and, and uh, Chris, and June, and, and others, and um, our colleagues from Agoric also, uh, there are also people from academia who are working with us closely. And so, Fernando and Daniel from Lugano are here with us today. So we work with them on a Gossi protocol. I also talk a bit today 
Uh, we have also very good collaboration from Inria Paris. Uh, Cesare Dragoi is, is a researcher there working on the software verification side. And we also have a um, uh, collaboration uh, with uh, Rashid Gerawi, a historian from EPFL. And also, uh, Stanford and Berkeley are uh, initiative on a critical security side where we don't have really, as we don't have internal uh, capacity on kind of working really on this. So, this is like externally funded uh, uh, research project. A very important one. But So, this is more or less like the, we have kind of few models, and I hope that this will grow. So, the, the, our plan is to really try to drive this and to uh, to help this community grow because uh, it's clear that, that the project is, is going beyond just you know ICF for tender meter or cosmos. So these are very hard computer science uh, challenges we are facing and without you know help of, of all of you and more even people there is no way that you can you can succeed here. Um, so today I will I will talk about a few projects um, just to give you a hint of something like the most recent uh, results we have. Uh, mostly uh, at the level of this kind of implementation or, or gossip layer, uh, then a little bit uh, just scratch the, the verification part, we're just bootstrapping, uh, and then I will talk a little bit of the, about fork accountability and my client results. And, and then Graham will talk a bit about the, the, our effort into setting up the industry grade research infrastructure for um, experiments reproducibility, which I, we we hope it will be also interesting for, for researchers and not just engineers. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so let's start just with the how more or less like a typical tender in setup look like, like, like for example in Cosmos Hub we have something more or less like this. So sorry for the the evaluator was a bit uh, messed up uh, with the export. So essentially we have several kinds of nodes, and um, so. We have validators who are like uh, kind of the, the main main or a core part of, of this infrastructure. They're running the secure infrastructure and they are they're involved directly in the tendering consensus protocol. But then we also have these guys are normally like uh, behind the private IPs, so you cannot talk directly to them. Uh, so they are surrounded by by what we call sentry nodes, which are like nodes which more or less run the, the same code. Uh, just they don't, they cannot assign the protocol messages, and they are they are surrounding the the validators, and they are connecting with each other in a, some kind of, of mesh network. There are also full nodes, which are you know also uh, like sentries, but they don't have direct access to validators. And we also have like seed nodes, which help bootstrapping and of course client. And so right now in a Cosmos Hub we have 100 validators, and probably like uh, in total more than 500 nodes which are worldwide spread and, you know, like, no one is kind of having uh, control of them. So it's a fully decentralized infrastructure. And uh, they talk all, all, all across, like, uh, wide area network and, and so, like, uh, tr trying to solve uh, consensus in a, in a BFT uh, environment. And so this is, this is kind of super challenging. Like, this is something which like if, if you come from academia and, and you are familiar with BFT or consensus protocols, this is very different from like people were looking there. Like the, normally uh, in, in academia, uh, we were having protocols focusing on like local area networks, small number of nodes, uh, single administration domain, and it was challenging. And so now we are, it's like probably few uh, uh, level of complexity harder. And so uh, we'll talk with you today like, about those challenges and how we, we are trying to address them. And so this is more or less kind of reality. So we have a code which is run by, by the, the set of engineers and which is then deployed and used by some other people, which we kind of don't know who they are, essentially. And this is more or less how the setup look like. And so like when we start from a more formal point of view, trying to analyze this problem now, you, you are kind of a researcher and then you want to understand, okay, what is the problem I'm trying to solve here? So then, then this is more or less what kind of the best thing we have right now. So it's it's a consensus problem uh, in a Byzantine Fontorant model, which is defined by these three properties, which essentially means that like uh, we don't have forks during normal execution and eventually we are able to create blocks if correct processes are able to talk to each other in a, in a, a timely and reliable way. And of course, there is some validity property that blocks need to specify, so they are they qualify themselves for being part of the block. 
And then we say, okay, uh, in what kind of model we can solve this? And then there is there are results from the, the theory which says, yeah, the, 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 the model which best captures the wide area network is partial synchronous system model. So we say, okay, this is nice, and then we can tolerate uh, at most one third of faulty processes, or in this proof state model, uh, working power equivalent of this. And then, uh, but now there is this, yeah, I forgot to say, like that uh, on, the, on the previous, sorry. So here, as you can see, uh, these validators, they, they, are, they are only connected to a subset of the nodes from the whole network. So everyone in the network is only connected to a subset of the nodes. So the way to actually communicate between the nodes or different participants is over the asynchronous lines. So everything is essentially must. And so this is like the, the part of the one really like challenging aspect. So now in the partial synchronous system model, we are we are adding this this gossip part, which we call group communication property like now. And as you as you see this thing, what we say here is that if a process correct process sent the message, then eventually this message will be delivered. And so if we are in a kind of this synchronous period, then there is a bound on it. And and before that, if we are in an asynchronous period, then there is no bound. So the message will but message will eventually arrive. And then in addition, we assume that because of this gossip nature of communication, if correct process got the message, then he will propagate the message or relay the message to all other correct processes. And so uh, this is how kind of we are, we are uh, from the theoretical point of view, are capturing this thing. And then, you know, we specify uh, this thing, uh, uh, we, write, we write kind of technical reports in a standard way, we write the proofs, uh, and this is kind of all good. And then you have like, uh, I don't know, how, how much line of code do we have in Tendrum? Do you maybe have a cool, let's say, I don't know, maybe 100,000 line of code, let's say. Like this. this is rough estimate. It's a lot of code. And so we have this one page of the protocol and few pages of proofs, and we have 100,000 line of code. <laughs> and so now the, the, like, the, the exercise or challenge is how we can kind of prove that this, it's in, indeed the same thing. And the results we have proven in the theoretical Thing are really you know meaningful in the in the kind of real world, and so the, the the part of the problem is also that when you look at this property, for example, gossip communication, uh, it's not what we implement. So we are using one kind of tools to talk about things, and then we implement something different because this is too kind of it's not practical. Like you don't want to capture all messages, buffer. You know this thing. If if you look carefully here, like for every message send, we need eventually to, to deliver the message. Now, this is very strong, like we don't need this really. And so this is like, uh, no, not just, like, this is the standard way how, how we are doing the protocol, uh, how we implement the practical protocol like this, this way. So we have abstractions, which we use to reason about correctness, and then implement, we implement something different. And then, um, now when the, our colleagues from formal verification side come, they want to express the things in their language and their tools. And so then they can say, yeah, if you express it in our tools, we can, again, guarantee that this is, this is correct, you know. But then there is, again, code. And, uh, and so, like, um, I guess, the, the, for me, the main challenge here, the main question is, how we can ensure this thing, you know, how we can try to cross the gap. And then the main challenge is doing this, not just doing it once, but maintaining this correctness in spite of the... Uh, the pace at which the, we have changes at the code level and, and maybe less at the protocol level, but still there are some changes. So this is kind of the, the question number one, and then more or less everything kind of follows from there. Yeah, feel free to, to interrupt me uh, uh, if there are any questions or, or uh, if you want some clarification or anything like this. But I guess for, for now it's good. Very good uh. Okay, so uh, to, to make things a bit more concrete, if, if you look at the current Tendermint architecture, the way how it looks like, so the... Just this word. No? So the... We have a set of modules. So it's a module architecture. We have a set of modules, we call them the upwards, uh, the call level. And so one is dealing about consensus. Then the other is dealing about mempool, like transaction gossiping. Uh, then we have uh, uh, a reactor we call fast sync. Like if you're new to the network, you, you want to download the blocks uh, in, a, in a fast way. Then there is evidence reactor, which is there to submit the, the proof of misbehavior, which is very important for security. And uh, maybe there are even more, but like there are a set of these modules 
which are doing different kind uh, in a protocol, but they, they should kind of, they, they sit next to each other and they, they should work in synergy. In some cases, there's also tight coupling between them right now. And um, they, are, they are built on top of the, the common infrastructure, which is here uh, denoted as P2P, which is right now in the current architecture, basically just deal with the very uh, low level stuff, like the connection management and, you know, like, uh, um, essentially kind of possibility to send and receive data. And then every model right now uh, has some protocol and it has the, the gossip. Because as you saw, like, we, we don't have full connectivity. So if you want to send a message, you need to figure out how this works at a gossip level. So right now we have this mixed together. Like every module has both protocol and gossip concerns mixed together in, inside the code. And so this is, uh, the, this is also a lot of headaches, and uh, it makes the code uh, essentially uh, pretty hard to understand, read, and test, and modify, finally. So the first step we are, we are kind of in direction of, of making this more correct and sound is making a split, split between the protocol and the supplier. So for every module, we want to, to make this separation so that it's easier to understand and to test this thing, and then potentially also replace it with something else. And this is something we are doing right now, uh, and uh, we are doing it uh, in the context of blockchain uh, reactor, or the state sync reactor, where, which is like the first exercise trying to really try out this architecture, which we are talking already quite some, some time about it. And so like, we already, uh, I think we are already uh, at a stage that we can, we can realize really in a practice on a code level that it's much easier to understand to uh, implement a test and to pro propose also new changes. Um, yeah, I forgot to say also that like every of those models, apart from you know mixing this thing, has its own uh, uh, different concurrency architecture. So basically, like it's story on its own. And so when you dive in, you really need to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how this thing works. So the, with this kind of separation, we also try to standardize. Uh, whenever possible uh, at a level of concurrence, so that you, you have some patterns at a level of the architecture and the code which are shared, so that you can, once you figure it out how it works, it's easier to, you know, to figure out the, the, the next stuff. And so the, uh, more or less, uh, also one nice thing is that, that the Joseph and Igor, so the verification guys, when they saw this, they said that, yeah, this is really cool because we can plug in the model checking tools to such uh, architecture relatively easy. And we can generate, for example, as a first step, uh, uh, abstract test scenarios using model checking tools. So that we have, you know, we don't need to, to figure out all the worst case scenarios which we want to, to test our code with. And so this is somehow kind of the additional bonus. And uh, uh, yeah, like the uh, modularity support creativity means that essentially once you have such architecture, when things are much more clear, then people are coming up with the new uh, ways. It's kind of obvious how we can improve this. And this is kind of also some nice thing we are facing these days. So, uh, so this is kind of the first step. And the second step is to actually push the gossip to the common layer. And this is something we are working now with uh, Fernando and Daniel. So it's more like a bottom-up approach. Because like a lot of those modules, they, they do gossip but they, they, they share a lot of concerns. And they also, uh, they have relation between them. Like for example, priorities are shared. And so because we are sharing the resources at the end, at the networking level. And so this is something which is, uh, uh, it's really a research project because uh, the problem is that the most of the, uh, as we saw also uh, on our initial slides, these communication channel obstructions in theory are, are kind of too strong. You don't want to implement that. So we essentially need to reinvent abstractions which at a communication layer, which would be strong enough so we can use them to prove protocol correct, but we can also implement them. And, uh, and right now it's not really clear for us how this should work. So this is really like it's ongoing research, but end goal is that you, when you write application uh, module logic, you are, you are concerned only with the sort of business of, the, of that module. And then you're only expressing your requirements at a code level, like I want to send this message and these are my requirements at a kind of quality of service level. And I got to figure out what is the most efficient way to, to do the, like really I offer it. Okay. Are there maybe some questions here? Yes. 
is it doing uh, like batching or quality of service? And are there sort of sometimes sub protocol definitions of those two things that are going to be a conflict with the gossip layers? <coughs> So the gossip can do batching. Uh, it's it's really like uh, so more or less right, right now the vision is that that at the product level you, you you say like I want to send this message, and then you know all messages from all modules go to the to this gossip layer module, and based on the the requirements and priorities of like module heads in overall function because they they, are, they live together they are doing the stuff together, but not all have the same priority at the same time. This is also something which changes depending on what mode you are. Then the gossip is supposed to figure out, okay, now what are the messages which have highest priority and I should, you know, send them. And more importantly, uh, when I should garbage collect them. Because the, in those protocols, we essentially, is a core based protocol normally. And so we want to send messages uh, to keep sending until at the application level we sort of reach another stage. And then it's kind of safe to garbage collect and stop sending those messages and then use resources for something else. And so the challenge is how to codify this relation. Yeah. That you sort of define, these are messages I want to send, and then you define the rules so you can figure out how to give priorities to what messages and not also how to garbage collect those queues. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, now, uh, just yes. Uh, just a question for a gossip protocol. It's not only about the priority. There is as well the receiver, the people who are receiving the message are different, like for the process algorithm, and for the transaction pooling. So uh, and this filtering, like uh, you want to pull it like a sub layer, of it's just kind of uh, uh, also work. So the so uh, so essentially the, the gossip is is dealing with uh, with essentially the the IO. So it sends and receives messages and then delegate it to the right modules. Uh, because at the end we are we are talking with the same set of peers. You know, you, you have like you as a known, you connect to a set of peers, and then uh, you establish connection to them. And then you're exchanging messages on top of those connections, like all modules are actually multiplexed on top of the, the set of connections there. It's just that you know they, they at some point in time, maybe you know, like state C has more priority than mempool messages because you are catching up. But once you catch up, then you probably want to give more priority to consensus messages and then mempool. And so like, if you are not careful there, then you, are, you might be using resources in a weird way. And so there is also one angle which is uh, uh, very important here is the uh, DDoS, like we, semantic DDoS, mo most importantly. So we want to be able to design protocol in a way that it's not easy to DDoS, like to just exhaust resources by sending few messages. And so all those concerns are, are a lot of them are, are uh, module independent. Like it's not important how you're doing mempool broadcasting. You still need to communicate with people, and there is relation in terms of, for example, priority between this module and other module. Okay. So the on a formal verification side, so more or less uh, as. As I said, like the distributed systems are hard in general, and uh, you know, figuring out all the test cases and core cases is, is like it's very hard. It's, it's almost impossible. Um, and so, more or less, the, the approach we we uh, we took for this is to, we hire guys who are kind of like the one of the best in the world. So, because foreign education is a huge community, but they they don't understand also distributed system people, and there is also a kind of need to bridge them. And so luckily, Joseph uh, put this effort with, with some verification guys, like including Igor and Cesar, and kind of did this work. And so right now, we have people who understand distributed systems, and they also understand the verification side of it. And so what, what they are kind of suggesting is that the, we, can, we can start by, by addressing more or less two, um, two angles of this stuff. First is that we want to do protocol verification by almost automated methods. That's one side of the thing. And second one, we want to engage with the engineering team and do the uh, software verification code design. Because like uh, the challenge as we saw, like the challenge is at a code level. This is the main challenge. And so like uh, if you just give the, the, the current code base or any code base to, to these verification researchers and say, yeah, please verify this thing, there, there is no way. Like, uh, and so right now we need to more or less uh, to, to let them 
influence the design and so implement the code in a way that they can connect and do something useful. And so that's why we have we are kind of building a team of mixed engineers and researchers who will hopefully come uh, to some you know answers to these questions together by working together and trying out different things uh, at the both code and, and you know like formal education tools level. Like. And so like the, the more or less like state of the art right now, and this is like a starting point for us, uh, because this is a project we are kind of just bootstrapping. It's a Byzantine model checker, which is done by Igor and Yosef and, and published uh, like the, the main conference for the ver verification research of people. Uh, there's, it's all open source tools. All those tools are open source. There's also the uh, Appalach TLA plus model checker, which is trying to uh, implement TLA using a uh, um, symbolic uh, um, verification, which is a uh, uh, much more efficient than the current one. So TLA is, is a nice tool. There are many distributed protocols which are expressed in this thing, but then if you try to use it, it's, it's so slow that like uh, also it doesn't scale in terms of number of processes. Um, so this Appalachia is, is an effort into trying to make this more approachable. And uh, and the last thing is probably the most interesting one. Uh, it's actually approach how you can uh, use some techniques directly at the code level. And so instead of forcing engineer to write the protocol in you know language of verification guys uh, choice, uh, they come up with approach which look at the existing code and try to reverse engineer a synchronous version of the protocol, which can then be easily more easily monitored. And so this is what I call async to sync reduction. And they have proven that that by doing this exercise, they don't lose any important problem. And so this is something which uh, it's a work which also published uh, uh, this year a conference for benign case, like they're able to do this for Paxos Raft and, and this kind of benign protocol. And now we are working with them extending this for, for a Byzantine Fulterant case, like looking at Tendermint and also other protocols. Okay. Always stand with time. So. Do you, have time, do you have time for one question? Yes. So that very last bullet point sounded really hard. Can you say anything about the uh, proving something about asynchronous uh, protocols by converting them to seemingly equivalent synchronous yeah. protocols? Yeah. So this is like so this is uh, um, this works only for consensus protocols right now, okay. or like consensus and broadcast protocols. Um, and so the 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 core um, the core somehow abstraction in, in this work is something called a heart of model, which is the the mo round based model, which is able to it looks like a synchronous, but it supports asynchronous computation. And so it, by by having this kind of what looks like synchronous rounds, they are able to significantly uh, reduce complexity of model checking. Because you don't need to look at the all possible combination or like interleaving between message sending and reception, but you are bounded at the round level. And within a round, you have part at which you send and part at which you process messages. And so this HO abstraction is sort of key uh, corners on there. And so they have now reduction to more or less take asynchronous code and to translate into equivalent in the HO model. And they have proven. Uh, that by doing this exercise, they don't lose any important properties. Okay, I can see consensus and round-based makes it much more direct. Exactly, exactly. So maybe I was not very, very precise here. We cannot do this for all kind of problems. This is impossible. But like for consensus, which is core, like uh, a core kind of issue for us, th this is possible. And so the it's it's very elegant solution. And of course, for Byzantine case. It's more challenging than for a crash stop mall, but um, we have pretty good uh, uh, intuition and, and confidence that we can do something interesting there. Okay. Yes. Uh, so formal verification relies on some pre-built models. Mm -hmm. I mean, you create a proof based on some mathematics constraint that you already have. It. So basically, you thought that you want to do like code uh, formal verification. So, for instance, if I have a code base and I, I have fully proof of that, that it's working, once I modify a small portion of that, 
my proof, my model should be updated. How do you close the loop? How do you update the model so that actually your mechanism still, still runs? Because right now, if you look for, for instance, a K framework or for whatever other framework that try to do the formal verification, all have this problem. It's very hard to close the loop, to have a system that adapts with your code. Yeah, yeah, this is a very good point. So like the, although I'm not a verification expert, so what I'm saying is kind of what I heard from the guys. And um, uh, it, so it can be a bit superficial, but there, there is a, a, a side of all checking, which is like a, a mechanical proof based. And there, like, essentially, you, you take something which should be relatively stable, and then you write the semi-checked, uh, semi-manual, semi-automated proofs, which can be quite lengthy, and you prove the thing. And this thing, if you modify a single line, then it's almost like everything is lost. And so this is something we are, this approach we are not very interested in, because it's, it, it's not clear how, you know, to scale this to, to the, our need. Um, now, this reduction approach, is, is something slightly different because there you don't uh, you more or less start from the from the code and then you you kind of press the button and then you get by this reduction algorithm you get the version or current version of the code in this HO representation and then you you press another button and then small checking comes in and tells you whether it's fine or not and so this is something which is like uh, for us, it feels uh, much more natural in our context because the code is evolving all the time and we want to have confidence all the time, we're not breaking things. So it's a very different uh, way of, of writing tests. We also want to use model checking tools, but uh, it's, it seems right now that, that the most useful uh, way of using it uh, is more, con like, uh, more standard model checking tools uh, is at a level of generating test scenarios. So, like, ideally, we have a specification written in, for example, TLA plus, and we want to generate the abstract test scenarios, which then anyone who is, wants to implement Tendermint in any language can can try to run against and see whether they are passing the specification or not. So, it's more like a test case. In that case, it's the, it's kind of generating test cases, but like uh, also proving that so model checking tools apparently. So, this is what I'm saying. Uh, that they can also prove correctness, but they can also generate the uh, sort of uh, test scenarios which prove that something is wrong. So like, uh, but this is something which I hope we'll have uh, more concrete stuff to say in the future. Right now, this is like, very, my understanding is very superficial there. But we don't, we, we don't plan to use mechanical uh, model checking stuff. We definitely, so for us this uh, uh, maintaining correctness in spite of changes is, is mandatory requirement. And so the, I don't see how we can use this mechanical stuff. Like, uh, there is no way that this is so stable, like, I don't know, maybe some plain code, and then it makes sense to put this everywhere. So we need a different way. And so this last thing is something which we are hoping, like, dream is to, to plug this to the CI. And so whenever you, you before release, you, 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 know, you go through this and see whether something breaks or not. Have something like a framework in place, or are you working only on the research part? This, so, so right now, this is a this is research stuff. We don't have anything industrial level quality. Uh, so they have a, a prototype for this. It's a research prototype used mostly to as a proof of concept to, to publish a paper. Uh, and but we now, as as a, at least part of the team drawing ICF, uh, will try to industrialize this thing. So the, for us, research is important, but it's more important how to really use this thing. So, yes. So, um, what do you want? Just keep talking. Don't okay. fix it. No, no, no. Um, using formal verification, anticipating using formal verification uh, as part of a commercial development part of a project with deadlines. Uh, when you fail to prove something, what does the actual software development process as applied to the, the proof exercise look like in reacting to the failure to prove and how much does the tools you're using give you good diagnostics to figure out why you failed to prove? Yeah, that's a very good question. So more or less what we are trying to, to figure out here is a new development process. 
So I think that the most uh, valuable outcome of this exercise broadly would be really how to uh, design and implement uh, reliable distributed systems using the tools we have right now. So r right now we are just uh, starting this process. So we don't have a like, concrete, uh, I don't have concrete answers to this. But we re the, our plan currently is starting with this blockchain reactor stuff, is that we have right now the code, we have the architecture, uh, we have some uh, manual proofs that in these specify specification, and we want to plug now the model checking tools and see what, what would be the output. Maybe generate these test scenarios and then uh, try to go against them. But the idea is really to close this loop. That as part of development, you write code, you go to the checker, if something failed, these are the, the you know, bug creative which you try to address both at the design and code level, and then you are somehow maintaining this correctness all the way. But it's, we don't claim that we know how to do this, it's just a very important goal we set, and you know, we, are, we are building a team which hopefully will be capable of, of you know, pro making some steps there. Okay. Uh, so we have 10 more minutes, so, so I will maybe just uh, uh, talk two slides just about fork accountability and then uh, Greg can, uh, can just explain uh, briefly experiments and then we can, or maybe we can immediately do this so that uh, then people can uh, ask questions regarding fork accountability on my clients if you have more time. There is there is a small break after this, a uh, 30 minute break, so if everyone's willing we can also kind of extend this talk into the break. Is everyone fine with that? Okay, so we'll go a bit longer than the desired time slot. So we have five more minutes of talk and then Greg jumped in. Okay. So, uh, has anyone ever heard for, for term fork accountability? Okay. You are inside the very team, they don't train scan. <laughs> <laughs> This is a top secret project. We are working on a side that no one knows about. Uh, so essentially, like the model in which tendering operates is that we, is, if we have less than one third of uh, um, faulty processes or voting power equivalent of faulty processes, then we are able to guarantee uh, correctness. So both uh, safety and, and lives. So we are able to generate blocks in spite of less than one third of guy behaving in a, a completely arbitrary way. This is what tendering gives you. Unfortunately, we cannot control the number of faulty processes. So, the, so we could have executions in which uh, people decide, you know, to, to for any reasons, to agree and do uh, uh, malicious stuff and essentially go beyond this this threshold. And in that case, we have fork. And uh, this this is kind of bad because forks are not normal part of operation in Tendermint. And then the question is, what are the guarantees we can assure in that case? And so fork accountability is more or less ensuring that in case of fork, so when you have more than one third of faulty processes, we can detect faulty guys. And then at the level of, right now, social consensus, prove this to anyone and then exclude them from the game. And so the, yeah, so uh, when we talked the first time about this, uh, Anka was saying like, but this is not possible. So like, uh, so it's, it, it seems possible, and um, essentially it's really the base of tenure and security model. So we really need to be able to do this. Otherwise, uh, we are not really able to provide the security to our users. Because uh, the, really the part of the game is that if war happen, what you do then? Because this is really the, the, the critical part. And so like, uh, the way how Tendermint works is more or less that we have we have some uh, we have rounds and in every round we go through some steps. So protocol clearly specify when you're allowed to send particular kind of message. So for example, if you are pre-committing, which is a vote to really commit the block to the blockchain, you can only vote or pre-commit a block if you receive uh, more than two third votes, uh, what you call pre-votes. So before that. And so if you, if you just pre-commit for some block without seeing this thing, you are doing something wrong. This is not according to a specification. It's just one example. And so you can define, just by looking at the specification, what is the really correct behavior. This is finally what specification does. And so, uh, like, what are then examples of this fork accountability? So for example, if we have, we have four processes and we are able to tolerate up to one fault, 
This is less than one third. And we have two folds. Then what can happen? You can have uh, these faulty guys uh, essentially creating a brain, brain split. This is a fork, essentially. So they both, they pre-commit green to one set of processes, and then they send pre-commit blue to other guys' processes. And so two correct guys will actually commit different blocks. And so if this happens in a, in a, in a context of a single round, then its fork accountability protocol for detecting faulty process is trivial. You just need to collect all messages from correct processes, and you will see that the process pre-committed green and blue in the same round, which is not according to the protocol. And so this is kind of relatively simple. The more tricky stuff is that if you have a commit in, let's say, round four, and then in some later round, for example, round eight, there is a commit for different block. Now, even like if you collect things, like it's not anymore obvious which one are flagged, which are correct. So the, you need to do more. And so the, essentially the way how we imagine this fork accountability protocol is that in 10 minutes, all votes you send are logged to the, the storage. And so in case of fork, we have a separate protocol, which is like operating under a different model, uh, and which assumes central entity collecting all these, what we call, vote sets from processes. Uh, during, let's say, reasonable amount of time, let's say a few days. And then if you haven't sent the vote set, then this is your, your guilty, essentially. Uh, there is no excuse not to do this thing. And then uh, we have some set of rules, which, as we saw, based on the spec, should never happen in this trace. Because the vote set, essentially, for every process, gives us a trace. Like, if I send pre-commit message, I should have in my log uh, enough pre-vote messages to sort of support this thing support this section. If I don't have it, then I'm faulty. And so uh, we have a set of those rules, and the key thing is that in case something bad happened, enough number of correct processes, it's guaranteed that enough number of correct processes have seen a message which will be used as a sort of proof of misbehavior. Uh, uh, since we're uh, already running late, feel free to uh, tell me not to ask this question. Um, uh, I'm going through a chain of reasoning as I'm listening to this that, that um, uh, also derives that what you're saying is impossible. So I want to try it out on you. Mm -hmm. um, if you can do this, then you could do all of these checks during the round, identify the misbehavior, and if you can identify the, I mean, if you can identify the misbehavior from evidence during the round, then by enough sharing of messages back and forth you should be able to engage in that detection during the round. But if you could detect it during the round, then you could tolerate more than one-third faulty during the round and break the impossibility theorem that you, that you can't tolerate more than one-third. So I don't understand how you escape Yeah, so apparently this is, I think, there is a possibility result which kind of prove that it's not possible. So you can't do the thing, uh, you can't solve consensus which tolerates up to one-third, and with the same protocol, also tolerate more than one turn. So only when, like, either you are on a safe side, or when you cross the boundary, you're able to detect this. And so, but regarding this kind of runtime checks, there is nothing uh, preventing us from doing this in real time. Like, you just need to guarantee that you exchange information, or you're able to obtain information from correct processes, uh, kind of all the time, or on time, and then you periodically run these checks. Well, I, would just, I would just add to that. The problem is that this protocol is synchronous. It requires a strong synchrony assumption. And you want that synchrony assumption to be large enough that you expect it to be, uh, you want the, the latency time to be large enough that you expect to actually be able to satisfy that. And so you can't run that during the normal operation of the protocol because you want the normal operation of the protocol to be able to, you know, to have an asynchrony assumption in, or you know, a partially synchrony assumption where the synchrony bound is kind of smaller. So in real time, if you try to make this kind of synchrony assumption, which is something on the order of, say, 24 hours, you know, say there was some major catastrophic issue, um, you couldn't actually run that during real time because it would just slow down the protocol quite dramatically. So yeah, yeah. I, I accept that as an engineering trade-off, but with regard to the issue of possibility, you have to say, well, what if, you, you know, what if your semi-synchronous assumption has a round of a year? It should still be impossible. Well, so with, if you, if, 
in a synchronous protocol, you can do BFT up to 50%. So the, the one third is only for asynchrony. And oh. so the, 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 real, the real thing to figure out here, which I guess the jury's still out on, but all of our intuition says we can do it, is if you have somewhere between half and two thirds of faulty processes, can you still do this fork accountability thing? And, and we think yes, and exactly explaining and articulating, you know, how it gets around the intuition of why it should be impossible, is still requires some work. Okay, thanks. I got a lot out of that. Cool. Okay, so the, more or less the way how it works, or how we imagine right now it works, is that we ask processes to send them vote sets, and then we have a pre-processing stage where we are looking at the vote set and when we see, because all messages are signed, when we see message sent by P1, we take that message and put it in the vote set of P1. So that this is essentially like if there is some uh, uh, double voting, uh, then essentially this is sort of identified at this level. So every process um, is not able to hide, every faulty process is not able to hide by not including messages in their vote set. Because if correct process C, he can prove this is indeed done by this guy, so we put it in the, in the box of that guy. And then when we finish this thing, we go for each vote set of a process. We go and just check these rules, which are defined by specification. And so we do this at the level of every vote set of a process. And all misbehavior events, we are able to catch there. And so the only kind of trick here, this is kind of a very simple thing. The only important piece is that you need to have a proof that if there is a fork, important information are stored by correct process. But at least one correct process. And then more or less the, the, the procedure for this is relatively trivial. And we, we are, it seems that we have kind of this proof, so that this indeed works. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to skip the and No, 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 you can talk uh, Maybe you just take this. Uh... Wow. Well, I don't know how much you can see of that. Uh, hi, I'm Greg, um, working on infrastructure projects at the ICF, and um, a few weeks ago, Jarko approached me and asked me about how could we create test nets for the next research paper we're, we're going to do. A few months ago. A few months? <laughs> <laughs> so we came up with a, a little framework to make this a little better for ourselves and for for the next research page, papers we're going to do. Uh, we had two main uh, requirements that we set for ourselves. One is easy reproducibility, which is important if, you're, if you want this to be included in the paper. And the second one was uh, reusability, because uh, infrastructure guys are not, uh, they are sometimes lazy and you don't want to engage them too many times. <clears throat> so what we came up with is a project named Game of Tendermint. Um, the main purpose is, again, setting up these experiments for your research project, running them automatically, getting the results automatically, and then you can just include it in your project. Hopefully point to that one little thing that you need to give to people so they can reproduce your exact experiment. We chose Amazon as our platform. Uh, they have quite a few data centers in 13 regions, around 35 data centers, not including main mainland China, uh, which is enough for a distributed uh, experiment. But at least that's 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 what we have. Uh, they have something called images, Amazon images, which you can use to create your new server. We created a special image which contains a lot of a um, lot of our tools. We call this Night King, and all you have to do is create a Night King server for yourself, which will automatically go out on Amazon and build your Tendermint network for your experiment. Uh, build a few specific nodes which are not. Uh, part of the standard network, we call them the white walkers. They're the ones sending the transactions and doing your experiment on the, on the network. And then at the end of the experiment, it will just shut down all those nodes and leave Night King alive, which didn't happen in the pop culture reference, uh, and, um, and, and present you a website where you, can, where you can browse all your metrics that you uh, gathered from your experiment, uh, create dashboards, graphs, based on those metrics, also have pre-created dashboards and graphs, and use them to analyze your data, and then insert it into your research project. So, re reproducibility is easy because everything I talk about is coded uh, on, the, on this Night King 
uh, server. So you just have to point to your code and say, this is how you reproduce the experiment. Also, you buy an AWS account, you can run it because it's public. And you can recreate the exact experiment that the, the research paper is talking, talking about. Re, um, so that was reproducibility. Reusability is easy because we're an open source shop, so all we have to do is open source the Night King uh, build process. And you can always just interchange the experiments to your own and reuse the whole thing in your new research project. That's it. So thanks, Greg. Uh, thanks to Greg, we have uh, at least one project with a cool name on our research site. Uh, and so this is the last line. Uh, yeah, just this thing about what Greg is doing. I think it's it's probably like more important than just for research people. I think everyone who's using Tendermint has its own way to deploy and run test nets. And so hopefully this will also, uh, you know, like be more uniform way. Or, or save some bandwidth of people because it's really done in a very nice industrial grade uh, uh, quality. So uh, it's cool stuff. Uh, so final stuff. There are a lot of uh, risk challenges which are we know about them. Some we are trying to address. I just want to kind of list them and, and I'm finish here. Uh, one is really like at the protocol level. So we talk more about infrastructure here, but also just at the protocol level. We don't know how what is really the optimal protocol for transaction processing and for vote dissemination and round synchronization. Uh, and um, also, uh, uh, we would like to, to figure out how to use advanced crypto, like threshold cryptography, uh, aggregate signature capabilities inside the protocol because uh, this would potentially speed up things quite a lot. And, and finally, this was mostly about Tendermint. And so, on a, on a Cosmo side, also. We want to, uh, to try to do more formal analysis on both correctness, security, and uh, uh, crypto economics level of thing. And hopefully, uh, this is something we'll, we'll start soon. Uh, that's it for me. Is that a question? I wanted to ask about the, the full compatibility. Um, so if, if we don't have a fork, so if, if one person misbehaves, well, presumably the equivocation you can catch them, but do you have a scheme for catching them if they, uh, if they vote for something and they should be locked to something else? The kind of thing we need to do for this fork compatibility. Yeah, so, so, this, so we do have, we cover some of those cases uh, already right now at the code level. Like for example, if you equivocate, if you, if you double vote then, and we saw this, then, then this is proof of misbehavior, so it will slash for this. But the, this uh, fork accountability work actually uh, expand this to like more or less all kind of bad cases. And so like the, uh, we haven't discussed yet this uh, at a sort of engineering level, but there is definitely a possibility to implement this at a level of, of normal operation. So the only, also really uh, the mark question, so we, we can do this in parallel with normal operation, but just as a kind of separate protocol. The, what seems very hard is to merge this into the normal operation. But if you do it in a sign, you know, just to keep extending, you know, sending messages from time to time between each other, you can run those checks in parallel, and if you see something bad, you can immediately react. You don't need to wait for it to happen to do this thing. Because it's really able, you, you, we, we took a spec and we identified the kind of incorrect behavior. So anything which fits there qualifies as a proof of misbehavior. We, we can really package it as a proof of misbehavior and you know, use it uh, to, to slash it. But the, the short answer is right now, no, we don't. Like if you, if you pre-commit without justification, we don't track that because we don't require the pre-commit to carry the justification data. Yeah. Unlike say Casper, where every message comes with a full justification yeah, tree. Exactly. Perfect. So now we have a small break till I believe two fifteen and then the next talk will be about the IDs.